Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be at least making a start on my review of Deep Thinking, where artificial intelligence ends and human creativity begins by Gary Kasparov. So I'll read you the blurb and then I'm going to start going through. This is obviously non-fiction. Gary Kasparov is the chess champion. He was famously lost to IBM's Deep Blue computer in 1997, which was the first time a chess grandmaster, the champion of the world, had been uh, beaten by a computer. And this is like a new release, I think 2017, 2018, something like that. And it just, it looks at artificial intelligence and its effect on our society. So, just basically, the blur basically says what I just said. In May 1997, the world watched in shock as the world's greatest chess player, Gary Kasparov, was defeated by the IBM supercomputer Deep Blue. No need to use the word twice in that sentence, clumsy there, but uh, in deep thinking, Kasparov tells his side of the story for the first time, and exploring the past and present of AI, explains why he believes it's humanity's best hope for the future. So, I'm really fascinated by AI in general, I also actually write about it a lot, so uh, for my career as a freelance writer, my three main specialisms are tech, publishing and marketing. I've written about AI a lot, including for my client Emmanuel Fombu, I ghostwrite for him, so he's got a book out called The Future of Healthcare and uh, he's, I'm also working on with him um, his sort of sequel to that which is all about artificial intelligence as well, the economics of artificial intelligence and its impact on healthcare business strategy. So let's go in, we've got the introduction here, I've literally, I've only finished reading the introduction and I already have four flags, so I want to start this video now. I know it may be annoying to people and cost me viewers, I don't know, to like film in chunks, but for me, I think that's one of the best ways to do it because then I talk about it while it's still relevant and like fresh in my mind. And um, also, I can film this evening and then start editing later when it's too late for me to make noise by talking, you know? So I think this little bit here is interesting. Uh, ironically, if a machine did perform a chess simul against a room full of human professional players, it would have more trouble moving from board to board and physically moving the pieces than it would have calculating the moves. Despite centuries of science fiction about automatons that look and move like people, and for all the physical labour done today by robots, it's fair to say that we have advanced further in duplicating human thought than human movement. In what artificial intelligence and robotics experts call Morovex paradox, in chess, as in so many things, what machines are good at is where humans are weak, and vice versa. In 1988, the roboticist Hans Morovec wrote, it is comparably easy to make computers exhibit adult level performance on intelligence tests or playing checkers, and difficult or impossible to give them the skills of a one-year-old when it comes to perception and mobility. I wasn't aware of these theories at the time, and in 1988 it was safe to include checkers but not yet chess. I think this is fascinating as well, some stuff about Alan Turing, and I actually read Alan Turing's biography earlier this year. Um, so, the first real chess program actually predates the invention of the computer and was written by no less a luminary than Alan Turing, the British genius who cracked the Nazi Enigma code. In 1952, he processed a chess algorithm on slips of paper, playing the role of CPU himself, and this paper machine played a competent game. This connection went beyond Turing's personal interest in chess. Chess had a long-standing reputation as a unique nexus of the human intellect, and building a machine that could beat the world champion would mean building a truly intelligent machine. So it's fascinating to me, he wrote an algorithm and then processed the algorithm himself because we didn't have computers to do it. Turing's name, however, is forever attached to a thought experiment later made real, the Turing test. The essence is whether or not a computer can fool a human into thinking it is human, and if yes, it is said to have passed the Turing test. Even before I faced Deep Blue, computers were beginning to pass what we can call the chess Turing test. They still played poorly and often made distinctively inhuman moves, but there were complete games between computers that wouldn't have looked out of place in any strong human tournament. As became clearer as the machines grew stronger every year, however, this taught us more about the limitations of chess than about artificial intelligence. And uh, yeah, this is kind of cool as well. It talks about um, automated elevators and kind of compares them to where we are today with self-driving cars. The worries about operator-less elevators were quite similar to the concerns we hear today about driverless cars. In fact, I learned something surprising when I was invited to speak to the Otis Elevator Company in Connecticut in 2006. The technology for automatic elevators had existed since 1900, but people were too uncomfortable to ride in one without an operator. It took the 1945 elevator operator strike and a huge industry PR push to change people's minds, a process that is already repeating with driverless cars. The cycle of automation fear and eventual acceptance goes on. I thought there's some interesting stuff on this page as well there. I, I like this little dig at... Uh, well, you'll see. I remain an optimist, if only because I've never found much advantage in the alternatives. Artificial intelligence is on a path towards transforming every part of our lives in a way not seen since the creation of the internet, perhaps even since we harnessed electricity. There are potential dangers with any powerful new technology, and I won't shy away from discussing them. 
Eminent individuals from Stephen Hawking to Elon Musk have expressed their fear of AI as a potentially existential threat to humankind. The experts are less prone to alarming statements, but they are quite worried too. Shade thrown there. And um, yeah, this I thought was an interesting paragraph too. The airports with their self-checking kiosks and restaurants full of iPads are staffed by thousands of human workers, mostly using machines in the long security lines. Is it because they can do things no machine can do? Or, like operating an elevator and driving a car, is it because at first we don't trust machines to do a job where lives are at risk? Elevators became much safer as soon as the human operators were replaced. The human-hating Skynet from the Terminator movies could hardly do a better job of killing people than we do killing ourselves with cars. Human error is responsible for over 50% of plane crashes, although overall air travel is getting safer as it becomes more automated. So I think this gives some really interesting insights into the origins of uh, the modern game of chess. The games are what matter most to serious players, but history and physical relics also play a role in the game's status. The 12th century Lewis chessman, carved from walrus tusks. Illuminated Persian illustrations from 1500 of players accompany Rumi's poetry. The third book ever printed in English was Game and Play of the Chess, which came from the press of William Caxton himself in 1474. Napoleon Bonaparte's personal chess set. You start to see why chess fans resent it being called just a game. This is kind of an alarming stat in itself. Uh, advertisers are paid to exploit the power of symbols in a game we see chess routinely deployed as a winning metaphor. Chess imagery in ads for banks, consultancies and insurance companies seem obvious enough. But what about in the commercials for Honda trucks, billboards for BMW cars and online ads for dating websites? When you consider that only an estimated 15% of the US population plays chess, its cultural prominence is extraordinary. 15%? That seems really high to me. I doubt 15% of British people play chess. 15% might know the rules, maybe 1 or 2% regularly play chess. I thought this was interesting as well in terms of how, I guess, the programming works for chess computers. While chess programs today are so strong it's hard to tell the difference between their games and those of elite human grandmasters, it has proved difficult to create convincingly weak chess machines. They tend to alternate between strong play and grotesque blunders during the same game. It's more than a little ironic that after half a century of trying to build the strongest chess entity on Earth, the programmers today are more concerned about making them play worse. So I think this is interesting too in terms of how many possibilities there are on a chessboard. You've probably heard the famous story of somebody asking for a grain of rice to be doubled uh, on each of the squares of a chessboard and it turns out to be like more rice than there is in the world. In an average position there are around 40 legal moves. So if you consider every reply to each move you already have 1600 moves to evaluate. This is just after two ply, as programmers call half moves, one by white and one by black. After two moves each, four ply, there are 2.5 million. After three moves, it's 4.1 billion. The average game lasts 40 moves, leading to numbers that are beyond astronomical. The total number of legal positions in a game of chess is comparable to the number of atoms in our solar system. A lot of moves. There's a long old section here I want to read out. Um, so, romanticising the loss of jobs to technology is little better than complaining that antibiotics put too many gravediggers out of work. The transfer of labour from humans to our inventions is nothing less than the history of civilization. It is inseparable from centuries of rising living standards and improvements in human rights. What a luxury to sit in a climate controlled room with access to the sum of human knowledge on a device in your pocket and lament how we don't work with our hands anymore. There are still plenty of places in the world where people work with their hands all day and also live without clean water and modern medicine. They are literally dying from a lack of technology. It's not just college educated professionals who are under pressure today. Call centre employees in India are losing their jobs to artificially intelligent agents. Electronics assembly line workers in China are being replaced by robots at a rate that would shock even Detroit. There is an entire generation of workers in the developing world who are often the first in their families to escape farming and other subsistence labour. Will they have to return to the fields? Some may, but for the vast majority this isn't an option. It's like asking if all the lawyers and doctors will have to return to the factories that don't exist anymore. There is no back, only forward. We don't get to pick and choose when technological progress stops, or where. Companies are globalised and labour is becoming nearly as fluid as capital. People whose jobs are on the chopping block of automation are afraid that the current wave of tech will impoverish them, but they also depend on the next wave of technology to generate the economic growth that is the only way to create sustainable new jobs. Even if it were possible to mandate slowing down the development and implementation of intelligent machines, how? It would only ease the pain for a few for a little while and make the situations worse for everyone in the long run. Unfortunately, there is a long tradition of politicians and CEOs sacrificing the long term and the greater good in order to satisfy a small constituency at the moment. Educating and retraining a workforce to adapt to change is far more effective than trying to preserve that workforce in some sort of Luddite bubble. But that takes planning and sacrifice, words more associated with a game of chess than with today's leaders. 
Donald Trump won the US presidency in 2016 with promises of bringing jobs back from Mexico and China, as if American workers can or should be competing for manufacturing jobs with countries where salaries are a fraction of those in the United States. Putting high tariffs on foreign made products would make nearly every consumer good far more expensive for those who can least afford such an impact. If Apple offered a red, white and blue iPhone made in the United States that cost twice as much that cost twice as much as the same model made in China, how many would they sell? You can't discard the downsides of globalization while keeping the benefits. I do actually think they would sell quite a lot of them though. This was quite interesting too. Um, fighting, against fighting against disruption and change is also a standard business practice, one that is usually employed by a market leader trying to protect that lead. There are countless examples of this from the real world, but I'll take one ad absurdum case from science fiction, the 1951 movie The Man in the White Suit, starring Alec Guinness. Guinness, the protagonist, is a rogue research chemist who invents a miracle fibre that never wears out and never gets dirty. Instead of the fame, riches and Nobel Prize you might expect, he ends up being chased through the streets by angry mobs once various interest groups realise what his invention will mean. No more demand for new cloth, so the textile industry will be wiped out along with thousands of union jobs. No more need for laundry soap or laundry workers who join in the pursuit. Far-fetched? Certainly. But I don't think you have to have any suspicious mind to wonder if light bulb companies would sell an indestructible and everlasting bulb if they could make one. But resisting change and delaying it to squeeze a few more dollars out of an existing business model usually just makes the inevitable fall all the worse. He quotes Bill Gates here as well, which I thought, this is a great quote. We always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next ten. And so Kasparov says we expect linear progress, but what we get are years of setbacks and maturation. Then the right technologies combine or a critical mass is reached and boom, it takes off vertically for a while, surprising us again, until it reaches the mature phase and levels off. Chapter 4, I'm not going to read it out, but it starts with a section of uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where the computer gives the answer uh, to the question of life, the universe and everything is 42. And he says the problem is you didn't have the right question. So uh, computers are excellent tools for producing answers, but they don't know how to ask questions, at least not in the sense humans do. And he talks about uh, when he saw uh, a guy called Dave Ferrucci, one of the creators of the IBM Artificial Intelligence Project called Watson. So he said, computers do know how to ask questions, they just don't know which ones are important. And Kasparov says, I love this because it has several layers of meaning and all of them provide useful insight. One thing that I thought hilarious as well, uh, Kasparov won a Mercedes Benz in a chess championship in Germany in 1985. But obviously this was before the fall of the Berlin Wall, so he couldn't actually take it home and drive it. It's really interesting that he lived through, you know, the fall of the Soviet Union and then the rise of artificial intelligence and now he's writing this in 2017, you know. He saw a speech by a, a guy called Leonard Kleinrock of uh, UCLA as well and uh, he said, that's him, that's the guy who sent the L and the O. And that's because the very first attempt to communicate over the internet, they tried to transmit the word login, but the system crashed after the first two letters, so the first you know, information broadcast over the internet were, was just LO. It says here, um, which I'm not so sure about, but it says email predates the internet and was already widely used in the scientific community and on university campuses. It is the web we think of as the world changing invention. I suppose that's true, but they must have had like local networks and used electronic mail via a local network. I think this is a great example of the problems of artificial intelligence. So he says here, when Michi and a few colleagues wrote an experimental data-based machine learning chess program in the early 1980s, it had an amusing result. They fed hundreds of thousands of positions from Grandmaster Games into the machine, hoping it would be able to figure out what worked and what did not. At first it seemed to work. Its evaluation of positions was more accurate than conventional programs. The problem came when they let it actually play a game of chess. The program developed its pieces, launched an attack, and immediately sacrificed its queen. It lost in just a few moves, having given up the queen for next to nothing. Why did it do it? Well, when a Grandmaster sacrifices his queen, it's nearly always a brilliant and decisive blow. To the machine, educated on a diet of Grandmaster Games, giving up its queen was clearly the key to success. And there's another example of that from the movie Starman by Jeff Bridges, so I'm just going to read out this line of dialogue that again illustrates the error of making assumptions based on data. So basically, he's driving and he drives through this busy intersection and Starman says, okay? And Jenny says, okay? Are you crazy? You almost got us killed. You said you watched me. You said you knew the rules. I do know the rules. Oh, for your information, pal, that was a yellow light back there. I watched you very carefully. Red light stop, green light go, yellow light go very fast. And she says, you'd better let me drive. So he says here, um, he, was, he, he said in an interview, I don't know how we can exist knowing that there exists something mentally stronger than us. And uh, he says, that wasn't my last rash piece of rhetoric regarding computer chess, although I would have been fine had I stopped with computers. 
In an interview around that time, I predicted that a computer would become world champion before a woman did, which turned out to be accurate. It was interpreted as a sexist slight, which it wasn't. There just weren't any women on the horizon who showed the potential. And that would be the case until the youngest of the three remarkable Polgar sisters from Hungary, Judith, broke into the elite a few years later, eventually reaching top 10 status. I think this is interesting as well, something that I didn't know. Um, white moves first in chess and, at least at the expert level, this confers an advantage similar to that of serving in tennis. White wins about twice as often as black at the professional level, although half of all games finish drawn. And uh, the reason for this is basically because you move first, so it means you can land your attack first. And like in an amateur game, people quite often, you know, they waste time and they make moves that aren't helpful and whatnot. But at a, you know, grandmaster level, you can't afford to make any one wasted move. I think this is interesting here as well. He says, um, if you go and see an ad, wouldn't you rather see one you're interested in than one that you're not? This is not an argument for surrendering. To, this is not an argument for surrendering to Big Brother. Coming from the country on which George Orwell based his novel 1984, I am particularly sensitive to any encroachment on individual freedom. Surveillance can be an instrument of security or of, or of repression, especially with the sophisticated tools available now. All the wonderful communication technology we depend on today is agnostic, neither good nor evil. Assuming that the internet would magically set everyone free, as some appeared to believe, was foolish. Modern dictatorships and other political cliques are tech savvy and have learned how to limit and exploit these powerful new mediums. I'm glad privacy advocates are on the job, especially regarding the powers of the government. I just think they're fighting a losing battle because the tech will continue to improve and because the people they're trying to protect won't defend themselves. The barrage of privacy notices has become like all the disregarded warnings about the dangers of trans fats and corn syrup. We want to be healthy, but we like donuts more. The greatest security problem we have will always be human nature. I can see that. We have a little throwaway reference to Stephen King here as well, but I'm going to read the full, full paragraph because I think it's, again, an interesting insight into chess and how chess works. Both games with genius reflected the unique nature of computer chess, especially the second game. Chess players have the most trouble visualising the moves of knights because their move is unlike anything else in the game, an L-shaped hop instead of a predictable straight line like the other pieces. Computers, of course, don't visualise anything at all and so manage every piece with equal skill. I believe it was Bent Larson, the first grandmaster victim of a computer in the tournament play, who stated that computers dropped a few hundred rating points if you eliminated their knights. This is an exaggeration, but it certainly seemed that way sometimes. There is a similar effect with the queen, by far the most powerful piece. On an open board, that is, one mostly uncluttered by pawns, the queen can reach nearly every square in just a move or two. This raises the level of complexity dramatically, something computers manage far better than humans. Facing a computer with a queen and knight in an open position near your king is a horror fit for a Stephen King novel. So I guess we know what his Stephen King's 2020 release is going to be then. And this is quite interesting too, um, and I think, it, again, it, well, it taps into our human need to see stories and everything. Paradoxically, when other top players wrote about games in magazines and newspaper columns, they often made more mistakes in their commentary than the players had made at the board. Even when the players themselves published analyses of their own games, they were often less accurate than when they were playing the game. Strong moves were called errors, weak moves were praised. It was not only a few cases of journalists who were lousy players failing to comprehend the genius of the champions, or everyone missing a spectacular move that I could easily find with the help of an engine, although that did happen regularly. The biggest problem was that even the players would fall into the trap of seeing each game of chess as a story, a coherent narrative with a beginning and a middle and a finish, with a few twists and turns along the way. And of course, a moral at the end of the story. But he does say, um, Despite what I've said about the dangers of narrative, I cannot resist sharing this passage on the game from Charles Krauthammer's story on the match for Time magazine. This sort of storytelling I completely endorse. Late in the game, Blue's King was under savage attack by Kasparov. Any human player under such assault by a world champion will be staring at his own king trying to figure out how to get away. Instead, Blue ignored the threat and quite nonchalantly went hunting for lowly pawns at the other end of the board. In fact, at the point of maximum peril, Blue expended two moves, many have died giving Kasparov even one, to, si to snap one pawn. It was as if, at Gettysburg, General Meade had sent his soldiers out for a bit of apple picking moments before Pickett's charge, because he had calculated that they could get back to their positions with a half second to spare. In humans, that is called sang froid. But if you don't have any sang, you can be very froid. But then again, if Meade had known absolutely, by calculating the precise trajectories of all the bullets and all the bayonets and all the cannons in Pickett's division, the time of the arrival of the enemy, he could indeed, without fear, have ordered his men to pick apples. Which is exactly what Deep Blue did. It had calculated every possible combination of Kasparov's available moves and determined with absolute certainty that it could return from its pawn picking expedition and destroy Kasparov exactly one move before Kasparov could destroy it, which it did. It takes more than nerves of steel to do that. It takes a silicon brain. No human can 
No human can achieve absolute certainty because no human can be sure to have seen everything. Deep Blue can. So I thought that was interesting anyway, but also there was an added little bit of, I guess, personal interest for me as I've been learning French. So, saint means, you know, cold blood. Yeah, cold blooded. Hmm. I had to pause for a moment there. There's a great quote here which I really enjoyed. He said, uh, Chess has been described as trying to paint a masterpiece while someone yanks at your sleeve, and both players feel the same way. You must always remember that at every moment of a chess game, the position is a joint creation. I think this is interesting as well. Kas Kasparov spends a lot of time talking about how IBM really wanted to win, especially in the rematch. So you have an example here. Um, I'll return to other, even more intriguing sections of his interview later, but here he refers to Deep Blue's opening play in game two. We gave Deep Blue a lot of knowledge of chess openings, but we also gave it a lot of freedom to choose from the database with statistics. In the second game, in a Roy Lopez, the machine was thinking about a move like A4. A very theoretical move, and Kasparov was perhaps surprised when the machine started to think about a theoretical move. It thinks for 10 minutes and finally plays A4. What's going on? Then he probably started to draw too many conclusions. This was a new approach for the time, and Gary was never sure whether the computer was playing theory or thinking for itself. Interesting, although I learned about this technique not long after the match. It definitely makes sense to let such a strong machine have more input in its opening choices if it was truly stronger than many of the grandmasters whose games it would otherwise follow blindly. But what Illuscast said next was a shock. Of course, we also built in some tricks for Gary. For certain moves there was a delay, or some moves it played immediately. In some positions we bet that Gary would play the best move, and if he does, let's reply immediately. This has a psychological impact as the machine becomes unpredictable, which was our main goal. Amazing! They created program delays to trick me, and only me, since Deep Blue never had another opponent in its entire brief existence. It was also a one-way street, since Deep Blue was as immune to such tricks as it would be to Roy Lopez's suggestion to always sit where the sun would be in your opponent's eyes. All's fair in chess and war, I suppose, but this revelation was additional confirmation that winning wasn't everything for IBM. It was the only thing. This bit here is pretty interesting because it's kind of a damning indictment of the education system. He says, That our classrooms still mostly look like they did a hundred years ago isn't quaint, it's absurd. How can a teacher or even a stack of books be the sole source of information for kids who can access the sum of all human knowledge in seconds from a device in their pockets and do so far more quickly than their teachers or parents? The world is changing too quickly to teach kids everything they need to know. They must be given the methods and means to teach themselves. This means creative problem solving, dynamic collaboration online and off, real-time research and the ability to modify and make their own digital tools. Then he says at the bottom, Healthy nations approach education in the same way a wealthy aristocratic family approaches investing. The status quo has been good for a long time. Why rock the boat? I've spoken at many education conferences in the past few years, from Paris to Jerusalem to New York, and I've never seen such a conservative mindset in any other sector. Not only the administrators and bureaucrats, but the teachers and parents as well. Everyone except for the kids. The prevailing attitude is that education is too important to take risks. My response is that education is too important not to take risks. We need to find out what works, and the only way to do that is to experiment. The kids can handle it. They are already doing it on their own. It's the adults who are afraid. And there are a few bits on this page here I want to read out. So, um, he says, Many studies have shown that depression, or a simple lack of self-confidence, results in decision-making that is slower, more conservative, and inferior in quality. Pessimism leads to what psychologists call a heightened sense of potential disappointment in the expected outcome of one's decisions. This leads to indecisiveness and the desire to avoid or postpone consequential decisions. If those afflicted employ typical decision-making techniques, their results barely suffer at all. The breakdown occurs earlier, with the depression interfering with the fundamental habits of making logical decisions. He says, Emotional intelligence is only one of the many ways in which humans act irrationally and unpredictably. Economic theory is predicted on the fact that people are rational actors, that we will always decide based on what is in our best interests. This is probably why economists... This is probably why economics is called the dismal science and why there is a saying that economists have as much effect on the economy as weather forecasters have on the weather. Humans often aren't rational at all, not in groups and not individually. I like this little line here just because of what he lumps together. So uh, he says, but when they are isolated by researchers or exploited by advertisers, politicians and other con artists, you can see how we could all use a little objective oversight, which is where our machines can help us. I thought this was interesting too. He says, uh, your health is monitored by a device on your wrist and apps for counting calories and counting sit-ups. Studies tell us that we consistently overestimate how much exercise we get and underestimate how much we eat. Why? It serves our ends of thinking well of ourselves and of eating more snacks. Humans plus machine can keep you honest, as long as you are honest with your machines. I thought this was interesting as well. He talks about Isaac Asimov and he says, Asimov was fascinated by how human-machine relationships would evolve, as best evidenced by his more famous stories about robots. 
and based on the publication date of The Feeling of Power, it's certain that Asimov had more than a parody of human stupefaction and replacement by machines on his mind. The hydrogen bomb had recently been tested by both the US and the USSR, and the promise of nuclear fusion power was being debated against the possibility of a world-ending catastrophe. Would our vast new powers be used for good or for destruction? For most of human history, the answer has been both, although we have taken great strides in the past few decades of doing far more good than harm. Despite what you may think after watching an hour of cable news, we lead healthier, longer and safer lives today than at any time in human history. My last book, Winter is Coming, warned that this was a geopolitical trend, a season, and that it was reversible if we did not take action to preserve it. Our technology is not concerned about good or evil. It is agnostic. The same smartphone that brings people together all over the world can be used to connect with family or to plan a terrorist attack. The ethics are in how we humans use it, not whether or not we should build it. And I agree with that. I like this, just this little one-liner here. I think this is worth bearing in mind and thinking about. There's a business saying that if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And I think this relates back to this idea of how, um, you know, with the sum of the people we spend the most time with. Okay, so the file got corrupted somehow and we missed the uh, outro to this. But yeah, that is what I thought of Deep Thinking by Gary Kasparov. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of it, if you've read it. If not, let me know if you're going to pick it up. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.